Good morning. It is great to see you guys here today. It's uh, if you're here in Maryville or if you are at our new Bearden location, welcome. I'm so glad you guys are a part of what God is doing in that community. Or you might be watching online today, so we're glad you guys are with us as well. No matter where you're at, let's turn to the Gospel of John, and we're going to go to John chapter 12. We'll be there in just a minute. Um, it was about six years ago. And I wanted to experience a, a, a different kind of religious worship experience. And so I went to a really unique worship service in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, there, were, there, there are millions of people in that particular uh, religion. And I went to a campus that actually had 20,000 people in it. And it was quite the experience. I mean, the music was incredible. Uh, the, the crowd was friendly. Um, it, it was just such a, a, a warm and fun environment. Uh, the leader taught a lesson on the day that was inspiring as well. Uh, the only thing that may be a little uncomfortable is that the, the majority of the followers in this religion were teenage girls. Because <laughs> I was at a Taylor Swift concert. <laughs> And I had taken uh, then my daughter who was 13 years old and uh, we had a, a great time at this concert, but I noticed something that was really, really just insightful. And that was authentic worship of Taylor Swift was actually happening. I mean, there were these girls who were in love, giving their heart, wanting to express their devotion and their love to Taylor Swift. And, and so I noticed a few differences between like a normal Christian service, like what we would experience here, and uh, one of Taylor's worship services. You see, uh, for, for Taylor's worship service, you had to give your offering before they let you in the door. <laughs> yeah, that's a big difference. Um, at Taylor's worship service, nobody complained that the music was too loud, Nobody complained that the lights were too bright. Nobody complained that they had to park five blocks away and they had to you know, sit in traffic for a long period of time. No, when you worship at Taylor's church, nobody was worried about what people thought about them because they were into it, man. I mean, they were singing loud. And by the way, another difference, everybody was singing and there were no words on the screen. They knew the words by heart. Um, you had... You had people raising their hands, crying. You had people screaming as she got close to them, reaching out to touch her. I mean, this is, this is what authentic uh, worship and a response to someone that you actually love and hold in high esteem actually looks like. So Taylor preached the message for about 10 minutes and it was on love. And well, I guess that was another difference too. I tend to go a little bit longer than 10 minutes. Um, but it was no doubt a, a sermon. It was no doubt a message taught to uh, the followers that were there. And obviously, if you go to a concert like this, you know, it's not wrong to sing, it's not wrong to have fun. Obviously we did that and I was enjoying myself with my daughter, um, but make no mistake about it, it was authentic worship. It was people giving their heart and giving their best to Taylor Swift. And here's what I think. I don't think that you and I need to get better at giving our best. You are giving your best to someone or something today. It might be your boss, it might be your career, it might be yourself, it might be your kids. You're giving your best to someone today, so you don't need to get better at that. You don't need to get better at worship. You're great at worshiping, but what needs to change is the object of our worship. What it is we're pointing our heart to, what it is we're focusing our attention on. You see, we can tell what we worship when we think about what really stirs our affections, what really stirs our heart, what gets you excited, what gets you motivated, what gets you out of bed and, and gets you excited. For some of you, it's as simple as the fall weather, right? Beautiful, the last couple of days, we're gonna have a great, beautiful day today. The sun is out, the weather is perfect. For some of you, it, it, it's just that experience. For some of you, it might be a vacation. It might be football. It might be, you know, a new car, or new shoes. For, for you, it might be worshiping an experience, 
right? You've got to have the next experience to keep you afloat, to keep you happy, to keep you engaged, to keep you from falling into depression. And so the concept there would be worshiping the next thing. You see, for many of us, we haven't thought on the deeper level to really begin to identify what are we actually worshiping today? Think about it. When you're depressed, who do you run to? When you're sad, when you're lonely, who do you want to be around? When you begin to answer that question, then you can begin to actually be honest with yourself as to who or what you are actually worshiping today. Think about it. Who's getting your best? Who's getting your best attention? Who's getting your your best love? Who's getting the best of your devotion? Who's getting your best today? Or maybe what is getting your best? You see, we're going through a series here where we're talking about our core values. We've been talking about it every single week and today's core value you're familiar with, it's simply this. Jesus is the one that deserves our best, right? He deserves our best. He deserves our full focus, our full attention. Our heart should be stirred. Our affections should be stirred to glorify him, to worship him to put him as the priority in our life, to to, to have him at the center of our life. And the reason is because he deserves our best. And today we're gonna look at a story in John chapter 12, and we're gonna see a woman who gives an extravagant act of worship to Jesus. And, And the hope would be we would model her, we'd be inspired by her, that we would live our life like her. And in chapter 12, it's on the heels of a couple of things. It's on the heels of Jesus resurrecting uh, Lazarus, right? So that happened um, and he's a resurrection and the life that happens. He goes back to the town to spend some time with Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary. And right before chapter 12 starts, it says that the religious leaders are kind of spreading the word that they are looking for Jesus. If somebody will tell them uh, where he is, they're gonna go and arrest him. So this is not a safe place or a safe time for Jesus. He's six days away from his death. The Passover is about to begin. And this is where he finds himself in Bethany at this dinner. Verse one, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And so they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. (laughs) I love this story. Um, Mary and Martha are giving this huge thank you dinner for Jesus. My, my brother was dead and now he is alive. And of course they had been following Jesus for several, you know, uh, an extended period of time by this point. Uh, they worshiped, they were following him. And this dinner was like this huge celebration to, to say thank you for all that Jesus had done for them. In verse three, it says, therefore, uh, Mary, is about to do something extravagant for Jesus. She's about to do something out of the ordinary. She's about to give Jesus the very best of herself. She's about to sacrifice something worth more than probably anything else that she actually owned. The Greek word here for the the word pound is the word litra. And it literally means 11 and a half ounces. And so uh, roughly this is a 12 ounce jar. And so this is roughly like what she would have had inside the jar. And it says in uh, Mark, when it talks about the gospel of Mark, the same story, that she broke the jar open. 
So it wasn't like a lid, you screw on, you screw, screw off. She breaks the jar because her intention was to give all of it to Jesus. And so that's, that's quite a bit of oil. She pours the oil on his feet and she uses her hair to, to wipe it clean, right? An extravagant act of love and mercy. Uh, a rabbi was... Uh, had disciples and the disciples served the rabbi in various ways, but the, the disciples were never asked to actually clean the feet of the rabbi. Like that was for the lowest of the low servants who were around. And so she was doing the, the lowest of the lowest at this time was to wash someone's feet, but to do it with such expensive um, oil in this way was just a, a, an extravagant act of worship. And so the lowest part of Jesus was worth the best that Mary had. You see, the very lowest part of Jesus, his feet is is worth the very best that you and I have today. And so she anoints his feet. Now remember, Old Spice wasn't invented, right? There's no Axe body spray. And so at this time, people got a little stank on them, you know, after a while. And so they would use oil like this to kind of freshen up a bit. But, but not everybody had just nard uh, laying around because it was an imported, um, very special ointment. And so it would have come from spike nard, the, the, the plant that's called spike nard. It's kind of a weird name, but uh, it was only found in the Himalayan mountains. And so it would have had to be imported. And, and to have this much of that oil, you know, you buy oil and you're, you know, your essential oil kit, you know, you're getting like 10 drops in one of those little deals. Like, you know, and it costs you like, I don't know, hundred dollars. I don't know what you're paying for that stuff, but this is a lot of oil. And, and so it would have been important. She was either coming from a wealthy family or um, maybe this was like a family heirloom that had been passed on to her. But how much are we talking here? Well, Judas kind of gives a little description here. And he says, hey, why wasn't this sold for 300 denarii? So it was worth 300 denarii, roughly, at least if his um, value is correct. And so that equals to about one year's salary for a person at that time. And so roughly you want to translate it into our day and time. It's somewhere between 30 and $50,000 worth of ointment. Now, listen, when somebody pulls out a $50,000 bottle of anything, good things are about to happen, right? And, and good things are happening for Jesus and really everybody in the room because everybody can smell this. Everybody is impacted by this. And she pours the entire bottle out. Why? Because Jesus is worthy. He's worthy of your best. He is worthy of your greatest um, thing that you own. Right? He's not asking and she's not giving the very least that she can give. Our attitude to, when it comes to worship and following Jesus is not, what's, what's the least amount that I can give to make God happy? What's the least amount of time or energy or focus can I give to my creator, God, right? I don't wanna go overboard. I just wanna give just enough so he doesn't like do anything bad to me, right? Or any th- bad things happen as if that's a good theological way to view God. Now, you see, when it comes to giving Jesus our best, the first point we need to realize is that it's gonna require sacrifice. You're gonna have to sacrifice in order to give Jesus your best. And it's gonna be a sacrifice that, that you feel, like when you're sacrificing something, you're, you're, you're feeling it, right? Um, at this time, they were actually, literally when they went to worship, they were sacrificing animals. It was an animal sacrifice to God to pay for sin. And so they were either buying an animal to make a sacrifice or they were taking one of their own. And I guess the temptation for them would have been, well, let's take the really old animal you know, that nobody likes or the one that's got a broken leg or that kind of has a mangy kind of look. Let's take that one to the sacrifice because I don't want to eat that one anyway, right? And, 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 And let's do that. I'll take the cheapest bird or the cheapest dove you got there. Yeah, the one that's blind, I'll take that one. And God's like, no, 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 no. You don't bring the worst of what you have. You bring the best. In fact, in Malachi 1.8, God says, when you offer a blind animal to sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. 
And will he accept you and show you favor if you were to do something like that? You see, the point that that God was making to the Israelites at that time is that when you bring a sacrifice, you bring your very best. And when we give our best, it demonstrates that God is worthy of our best. If you're bringing him leftovers, if you're giving him just a little bit of time, a little bit of your mental capacity, if you're just giving him whatever you can, you can scrounge up, he says, that's not, that's not your best. And that is a, 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 something that breaks the heart of God. He requires our very best. So the question we have to ask is, what kind of sacrifice are you making for the Lord today? I'm sure you're making sacrifices for your family, making sacrifices for your career because you wanna make money. But are you making any sacrifices of worship to God? You might say, explain that a little bit further, Trent. What does that mean? Well, Hebrews 13 explains a a little bit about what sacrifice looks like, a, a sacrifice of praise. And so it says this, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Let's just hold. Let's notice a couple of things. Through Jesus, this sacrificial praise is given, right? It's through him that you can rightly connect to God and have a relationship with God. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sin and and, and offers you forgiveness. And when you receive him by faith, you get a, a, a brand new spirit, right? You get the promise of eternal life. So it's through Jesus that we can worship and connect to God. And he says to do this continually. This isn't just something we do on Sunday morning. It's not just something you do once a month. A sacrifice of praise is something that happens continually, daily, every single day of your life. And what does it look like? Well, a sacrifice of praise looks like the fruit of lips, right? That openly profess his name. So yes, worship is singing to God, meaning what we sing. It's a prayer to God. It's how we are connecting to God through this song, through this prayer that we sing to him. But it's also through talking about Jesus to other people. I mean, think about that. Have you openly professed that you're a follower of Jesus to anybody lately? Have, have you told the person you work with? Have you talked about Jesus with your family? Have you, have you prayed with people recently? I mean, this is what a sacrifice of praise looks like. It's openly professing the name of Jesus, praying in his name, singing to his name. It is talking about his name to other people. So the sacrifice of praise is the fruit of lips, but that's not all. If all we do is give lip service to Jesus, then, then in our actions didn't follow that, then that wouldn't be uh, quite right. So verse 16 says, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So he is pleased with a sacrifice that, that praises his name and talks about his name. And then that does good, does good to other people, adds value to other people's life and, and shares with others. So are you generous with your knowledge are you generous with what, what you know about the Lord? Are you generous with the truth that, that you have learned about scripture and you're sharing that with others? Are you, are you generous with your time and you're not just all about you and your schedule? Are you generous enough to serve other people? Are you generous enough to, to give financially? Yeah, that's a big part of our sacrifice is that we would sacrifice uh, money that we could easily spend on a vacation. And instead of that, we would, we would sacrifice that as an, an, an offering to other people, to even God as a sacrifice of worship. See, these are questions that believers need to ask and answer. Mary's heart is is clear. Her heart is to express her thankfulness to Jesus. Her heart is to express the worthiness of Jesus. He is worthy and rightly to be praised. Mary's giving Jesus her very best. And her response is an outward expression, right? But it was an inward commitment that she had. So she has this inward commitment and then it's it's externally seen by others. Sometimes we get that reversed. We wanna give other people around us this external kind of picture that we love God or we're, you know, we, we are believers or, you know, we're good people. But internally, our heart is far from God. Think about what she could have bought with this. Think about how she could have taken care of her family with this, a whole year's salary. She could have used or invested or used it in some different way, but this is the best decision 
she's ever made in her life. Because in this decision, she is expressing the value and worthiness of Jesus. And so she gives him the most expensive thing that she owns. And so what are we sacrificing for for, for Jesus today? And what's interesting is when this happens, Judas immediately questions her. And he says, this should have been used for the poor. But it's clear that Judas does not care about the poor at all. In fact, I would say this is true. You should expect criticism when you begin to give your best to Jesus. You should expect criticism to happen. And criticism will come from the Judases in your life. And the Judas in your life might be a family member. It might be a spouse. It might be a neighbor. It might be a parent, right? Every single day, we're gonna face a Judas potentially that's gonna try to distract you. That's gonna try to get your focus and attention off of giving Jesus your best. This person's gonna say, why would you go that far? Look, I, I get it, we wanna go to heaven, but, but that's too far, that's too much. There are other things you could have done. There will be all kinds of Judases in our life that will misdirect our attention away from giving Jesus our very best. And, and a lot of times it's masked with a super spiritualized statement, right? This is the, the hardest type to to actually avoid. Um, He doesn't say this because he cares about the poor. We've seen that. The text says that Judas um, would take care of the money. So people would donate money to uh, the ministries of Jesus and the disciples. And and he was kind of the caretaker of that money bag. And and so the scripture says that he was a thief. He would help himself uh, to that money. So he betrays Jesus and and hands him over to the authorities in a, in a couple of days, but he's been betraying Jesus for a long time because he had a problem with money. He loved money. He coveted what he didn't have. He had a scarcity mentality. He didn't trust God to provide for his needs and, and to bless him over and abundantly. He had a scarcity mindset and I've got to get mine. I've got to go after and I can't be generous. I've got to, I've got to go out and take. And, and, and when we do that, we don't trust. And so this was Judas's mentality. And he says, shouldn't this have been given to the poor? (laughs) I mean, how do you argue with that? You know, when you were young and you didn't finish all of your food on your plate and your mom was like, people overseas are dying of hunger and you can't finish your plate. (laughs) Like, what do you say to that? (laughs) Okay, I'll force feed these mashed potatoes, right? I don't know how to respond. How do you respond when somebody says, oh, well, you could have, you could have given that money to the poor. You, you didn't have to buy that car. You could have bought this car. And you, could have, you could have given that away. Well, how, that's, that's a very illogical statement because where does it stop, right? Where, where does that kind of mentality and, and, and thought process, you know, kind of work its way out? Because yeah, you could sell everything you own and wear one t-shirt and, and walk around your underwear if you want to all day long and like give all your money and everything away to the poor. But I don't think anybody wants to see you walk around your underwear this week. Like that's not, you know, that's not possible. So where is, where's the deal? We could have, we, we, we could have all, you know, gotten, we, we could wear flip-flops or walk around barefoot and given more money away. And so where's the line? Like, where is it at? Here, here's the truth. What I often see is, is sin often hides under the mask of holiness. It often hides under the mask of holiness. We like to say things and criticize other people because it sounds really holy and it sounds really righteous, but it doesn't reveal anything about what's going on in our heart. This is kind of an issue in our culture today, isn't it? I think so. It's like, um, we're really quick to criticize someone else how they're doing and how they're leading their life and very generous with how we deal with our own sin and deal with our own life. And, and I think by doing that, what we're saying is if, if you just knew what I know and if you just had the information that I had, I'm, I'm more informed. You've got misinformation. I got real information. And, and if you knew what I knew, then you would be better off than I know more than you do. Why, what, why do we do that? It makes us feel better about ourselves puts us up on a higher pedestal and we get to look down at all the peasants who don't know as much as we do. And so what do we do with that? How do we overcome that? Here's what you do, it's very easy. Give Jesus your best. Don't worry about what other people say. 
You, 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 you don't have enough time to worry about every person that's out there that wants to criticize you or condemn you. And you don't have enough time. If you're really giving Jesus your best, you don't have really enough time to judge everybody else and how they're living their life. You got your, your own cup to clean. You got your own house to kind of keep in order. And so, and so we do what we think is right in the eyes of God and, and we let the chips fall where they may, right? Sin often hides under the mask of holiness. And so we're gonna see several temptations here happen. We're gonna see this Judas come into our life and we're gonna see a few things. We're gonna see this person say, be reasonable, right? Okay, you can give to the Lord, okay, but 50 grand, come on, man, that be reasonable. I see this with parents sometimes. They send their high schooler to, you know, Wednesday night, their high schooler gets saved and man, God changes their life. And then all of a sudden it's like, be reasonable, son. Be reasonable, daughter. I, I'm glad you're excited about God and church, but do you really wanna go every Sunday? Like, how about like the once a month routine that we were in or Maybe they get called to ministry or they want to go to a Bible college. Just, whoa, 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 whoa. We had a plan. You were going to be a doctor. You were going to be a lawyer. You were going to do this and go to UT and go here. Be reasonable, right? Sometimes it's a spouse. You're like, hey, we really need to get committed to the church. We need to get committed to the Lord and we need to give and, 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 and they want to give a certain amount. It's like, whoa, whoa, be reasonable. You see, there are going to be Judases in your life. Mary is saying, and this is her heart, like Jesus is worth everything. He's, he's worth everything. He, he's, he's saying, lay it all down. But you're gonna have people say, be reasonable. He's not worth it. You're gonna have Judas come in and he's gonna say, be entitled. Live your life as if, you know, uh, God owes you something. You know, this mentality that says, you know, I don't need to give, I don't need to serve, I don't need to do all that. I just need to kind of show up and be present every now and then. I don't need to give back. Why? Because, well, God owes me. God owes me. If you have this entitlement that God owes you, then it's easy for you to steal from him. It's easy for you to steal from others. It's easy for you not to serve others. It's easy for you to take what you think that you, know, you need and what's good for you and forget about everybody else. Just be entitled. Judas is gonna step in and he's gonna say, be cynical, right? Just be, just be critical. Just be cynical. You know, God's not gonna do anything special for you. God's not gonna heal your marriage. He's not gonna make your relationship better if you go and if you, you know, start serving Jesus and give him your best. He, he's not gonna do anything. So, so it's a negative, 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 cynical, cynical uh, mentality to get your focus off of the, the, the faith and the hope that God does wanna work in your life. And he does have a plan for your life. So we give Jesus our best. We have to put the criticism, the entitlement, and the cynical personalities in our life away and give Jesus our best. Jesus said, you're you're always gonna have the poor, but I'm only here for a short time. So Mary gets it. She understands that. Judas doesn't. You know, the the, the poor was really a cover-up for him coveting. He wanted more money. Right? He wanted it for himself. We see that he sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, which is the equivalent of about $1,000. So for a thousand bucks, he turns Jesus in. He'd been stealing, he'd been betraying, he'd been lying, right? All behind the scenes here. Jesus knew what he was doing. He knew what he was gonna do. And yet he still showed him love. He didn't kick him out. Right? He still allowed Judas to be a part of that group. And, 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 and the Judases in your life are gonna, gonna be everywhere, causing you to lose focus of what Christ wants to do in your life. And this particular scene was the, the straw that kind of broke the camel's back. After this event, this is when Judas leaves and he goes and, and he Uh, turns Jesus over to the authorities. He tells them where he's gonna be so they can find him and arrest him. So this was a big, big day and moment in his life. And so the third thing, if you're taking notes, is the goal of giving our best is to honor Jesus. The goal of giving your best is to honor Jesus. Now, obviously, Mary is honoring Jesus by giving him this extravagant gift. She's sacrificing and Jesus is pleased with this gift, right? So, so uh, I think it's important that, 
that God isn't after your stuff, right? He's not after your material possessions. He, he doesn't, he has no need for that. He's not after money. He's after your heart. Because he knows if he has your heart, then you're finally gonna see him for who he is. You're finally gonna be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. You're gonna be able to worship him with all of your heart and realize that only he can satisfy, that only he can bring joy into your life. And your best is never gonna be good enough to earn heaven. So don't, don't hear me say that today. Your best is never gonna be good enough to earn forgiveness. No, the, the death of Jesus on the cross was saying that you and I are not good enough, but his death, his life was worthy. It was good enough to allow us to have forgiveness of sins and a connection relationship with God. And so what does it mean then practically? How do we wrap this up today? And I would say, when we are giving Jesus our best, it impacts every area of our life. So it's really all about stewardship. How are we stewarding the things that are in our life and the things that God is allowing us to be a part of? So let's start with this. Give your best at work. When you're giving your best at work, you are giving your best to Jesus. In fact, Paul says this in Colossians 3. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart, as if you are working for the Lord and not human masters. And so when you are going to work or if you're a student going to school and you are giving your best in that environment, you're not just doing that for yourself. It's an act of worship. I work hard, I focus, I study, right? I, I, I do what my boss asked me to do. I, I get things done on time. I bring my energy. I, I, I do what I'm, I'm supposed to do. I push forward, why? Because I'm not working for you, Mr. Boss. I am working as if I'm working unto the Lord. I love, um, in the book, Win the Day, I love what Mark Batterson says. He says, the true measure of success is not doing a great job when you get your dream job. It's doing a great job at a job you don't like for a boss you like even less. <laughs> Some of you are like, Amen, that's where I'm at, right? Your boss and your job, it's not your dream job. But the good news is you're not always gonna be there. But here's the good news, you can flip that script. You can, you can change your mentality and you can say, you know what? I'm going to work to give Jesus my best. And when you do, it honors him. You can give your best in your marriage. When you give your best to your spouse, you are honoring Jesus. When you're sacrificing for her, when you're sacrificing for your husband, you are giving your best to Jesus. And so Ephesians 5.25 says, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. So as Jesus sacrificed for his church, the church, you and I, not a building, people, he gives his life for us. In the same way as a husband, if I'm sacrificing for and to my wife, I'm not doing that just to make her love me. I'm doing that as an act of worship. And I'm saying, Jesus, I'm giving you my best as I honor my spouse. You see, some marriages in the room, it's like you, you have issues and you've got problems you're trying to overcome. And we all do, by the way. But let me just clear the air here. The reason is not because you married the wrong person. The reason is because you have a problem called sin. And every single marital issue you have in the room today is a product of sin in your heart and in your spouse's heart. And so the decision is, are we going to overcome that sin? Are we gonna work through that sin, confess that sin, identify that sin? And then as I do that, as an act of worship, I lay that at the foot of the cross and I say, Jesus, I'm gonna give you my best. I'm gonna treat my spouse differently. When we do that, things change. Jesus blesses. So give your best to your marriage. Give your best for your health because it honors Jesus, right? Every area of our life. So when we're giving Jesus our best and our health, we're not just taking care of our bodies because we wanna look good or feel good. Those are byproducts, right? We do that because taking care of our health is an act of worship. First Corinthians six nineteen says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. 
So as I take care of myself, as you take care of yourself, it is an act of worship to God. He doesn't call you to have chiseled abs or he doesn't call you to have or look a certain way. He's just asking you to steward your body well because your body is a gift from him. Give your best financially to Jesus. Jesus makes it clear, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we can't deny that. And so my wife and I, we have a thing and she knows I have a statement and, and the statement is, what do the numbers say? Can we do this? Can we do that? Well, what do the numbers say? Because I don't, I don't wanna get into an argument about what I want or what I desire. Anytime I make a, a, a decision financially based on what I want or what I desire, it usually leads me to an unhealthy place, a bad place. But when I come to that and I say, okay, what do the numbers say? You know, then it's like facts and this is what we can do and what we, we can't do. And, 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 and so for, for our financial life, when you spend all you have on yourself, you're essentially telling God, my treasure is me. And Jesus is calling you to give him your best. He's, he's calling you to treasure him over and above everything in your life. That's what it looks like to give him your best. We should give our best to our church because when we do, it honors Jesus. First Peter 4, 10, each one should use whatever gift he has to serve others, faithfully administrating God's grace in various forms. And so where do we serve? Well, we can serve in the confines on Sunday morning. We can serve each other in our small group, using our gifts to minister to each other during the week and in small groups and in our community. Like this is what it looks like to give your church your best. And when you do, you're honoring Jesus. And so bottom line is this, every single one of us, we need to just recognize this. We're going to give our best to what we love most. That's why I say the object needs to change. The energy, the focus, all that stuff needs to change on the right object. You're giving your best to someone. You are worshiping someone. You're great at worship, but it's the object that we lose sight of. And every single one of us, we're gonna worship what we love the most. And if it is not Jesus, it is an idol. And Jesus wants you to know that any idol in your life, anything that you turn to, anything that you look to, anything that you have to have outside of him is idol worship. And every time we worship an idol, it leads us to a bad place because you're gonna recognize and realize that it is empty. It's gonna lead you to finally see that it's never gonna satisfy you. It's never gonna bring joy in your life. And so we give our best to Jesus because he's the only one that can. In verse seven, I, I love Jesus is like, shut up Judas, leave her alone. Which by the way, we should do with some of the Judases in our life, just tell them to shut up, leave, leave me alone. He says, leave her alone, why? so that she may keep it. And that's a hard, hard verse to interpret. You know, you read the Bible sometimes, you're like, what does that mean? I mean, I looked at that, studied at that and looked up several things and I finally landed on this. This is what I believe it to mean. Leave her alone so that she can keep it. Keep what? So that she can keep the gratitude and the worship and the high esteem for Jesus, just like in that moment when he dies, when he leaves. Leave her alone so that she can keep this moment in her heart and know that what she is doing now is giving all of herself to Jesus. She's laying it all down and saying, you are worthy, Jesus. You alone are worthy. And I don't need anything else. I don't want anything else. I need you, Jesus. I want you. You are my treasure that I seek. You are, are the center of my life. And I treasure you more than any other relationship. I treasure you more than any other material possession that money can buy. I treasure you, God, more than any career that you might build for me. Why? Because he deserves our best. You're always gonna have the poor, Jesus says. You're not always gonna have me. And so give him your best. And so here's the final question today. Has your heart, is your heart more like Mary, sacrificially worshiping Jesus to please and honor Jesus with love and gratitude in her heart, willing to 
pour it all out for him? Or is your heart more like Judas? Self-righteous, worldly, only thinking about yourself. You see, the goal of giving Jesus your best, the goal of putting him and making him a priority is to treasure him above all things. And for some in the room, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Some in Bearden, you've never really committed your life to Jesus. And so you're just kind of wondering. And and I want us to go into a time of worship right now. And I know we like to kind of check out maybe mentally and not thinking, but I I, I wanna challenge you and encourage you to stay dialed in in this moment. We're gonna sing a song and the song is, 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 is designed to really help us connect to God. So if you've never given your life to Jesus, this would be a moment where you would say, all right, Jesus, if you are real, speak to me, open my eyes, open my heart that I might know you and see you and experience you. And maybe today you would actually give your life to Jesus or some of you are Christians and at the end of the day, you realize you're not giving him your best. And so this is a time of reconnecting, of confession with him. God, I've, I've broken relationship here. I'm dealing with this here. I'm worried, I'm trying to do it all on my own. I've lost the heart of worship. I've lost you as my center. Maybe you would say, man, I've become the Judas. I've been telling people be reasonable. I've been telling people to just be cynical. Nothing's gonna change. God's not gonna do anything. And I need to turn from my sin today. Lovingly put Jesus in the center of my heart. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you are worthy of our praise today. There are some in the room who are far from you, God, who may not know you. And I just wanna pray that in the quietness of this moment, you would speak to them. God, that you would open their heart, soften their heart to your spirit, that they would quit rejecting you and that they would receive you today. Lord, for those Christians in the room that are just dealing with sin, that are dealing with giving their best to other things in their life, would you make us aware, help us to see it, know it. God, help us to confess it to you. Turn from that and run after you with a new passion and a new energy. Make you our treasure above all things. God, move in this place as we worship you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Foothills Church. If you made a decision to follow Christ while listening today, or if you have some more questions about what that looks like, then let us know. You can text FC Decision to 97000, or you can head over to foothillschurch.com slash decision. We hope you have a great week.